initially thought to be a fad. Yep. The uh, uh, intention of a bunch of Columbia University undergraduates was to, uh, oh, at least uh, get a big time record contract if we could uh, be taken seriously. Uh, the um, organization we sprang from was a extracurricular activity that had been uh, going uh, self-perpetuating on the campus of the, uh, for more than 10 years prior to then. It was uh, along the lines of the Yale Whiffenpoofs or what have you, the uh, traditional um, college kind of barbershop-oriented um, uh, uh, show choir, the um, self-styled uh, show choir that we were, uh, was mostly finger snapping, vocal harmony, maybe an occasional acoustic guitar, and uh, a lot of patter and hijinks. And uh, uh, the year I joined, we started doing a generous dose of fifties doo-wop. Our biggest audience response often came from uh, our rendition of Little Darlin' done with castanets and uh, the uh, broad bass talk solo in the middle of the song and um, a little um, spontaneous choreography. But we did our shows in uh, civilian clothes, maybe uh, agreed on what colored blazer to wear, that sort of thing. It was a traditional respectable college fair for that uh, time period, which was the late 60s, kind of the the uh, anti-war thing was getting uh, very big, but the, the mindset uh, was still kind of, I don't know, post-Kennedy assassination um, idealism. Um, my own entry into college, I probably had it in mind that I was on my way to becoming an author, politician, and statesman, probably pre-law kind of uh, yeah. attitude. Uh, a number of the other guys in the uh, performing group were of traditional, um, maybe medical career aspirations and that sort of thing. We were just a, a bunch of uh, college um, musical guys with um, not necessarily... Uh, aspirations to becoming uh, music stars what did happen was that um, the big response we got from an all uh, doo-wop oldies performance um, gave us the further thought that it would be um, really shaking things up if we got a drummer and used electric instruments and uh, greased our hair and, and wore street clothes indicative of the uh, uh, early rock and roll period and uh, kind of uh, went against the grain of the time, which was uh, introspective, almost um, um, the long self-indulgent uh, guitar solo from the Eric Clapton or the Alvin Lee and the light show uh, on the back wall behind the performers, um, the likes of the what became familiar at Fillmore East and the Electric Circus in New York, that sort of thing. It was so hyper hip that it was like different from uh, rock and roll. Uh, it was calling itself rock. It was folk rock. It was uh, social consciousness. It was not, you know, rock and roll. Um, our intent was to uh, remind people where we came from and that this was good time music and our uh, good time uh, celebration of it. I don't know, you compare uh, Fourth of July parade when people wear uh, colonial costume to celebrate uh, colonial times. We wore 50s street costume to celebrate early rock and roll is the way I looked at it. So that was a lot of fun. It went over big at uh, Columbia University. First, uh, about the month of March 1969, an indoor auditorium. Uh, people um, in the audience came with their hair greased up and their old-time uh, choice of uh, 
jeans with the cuffs rolled up, maybe white socks, loafers, anything they could uh, put together that uh, evoked that period of time. And it was a, a really uh, happy, happy, riotous good time in that auditorium. The thing that made it uh, seem like even bigger deal was that it was spring of 69 when spring of 68 had been student riots at Columbia. Yeah. Essentially, without going into details about uh, how that came to be, there were uh, anti-war riots that got uh, so um, polarizing on campus that not only was the school closed and grades were reduced to nothing but pass-fail, for the final semester of uh, 1968, but also the uh, student body were somewhat uh, divided among themselves as to political um, favoritism, and um, um, there was uh, open hostility between um, some of what we would call for familiar terminology, let's say the far right versus the far left, and um, of course, at a at an intense place like Columbia, they all had uh, very uh, strongly held beliefs that they could uh, spend the afternoon or on on into the evening arguing about. And uh, since the previous year, there had been uh, instances of uh, some actual violence, and uh, it had been very ugly. That um, full year later, it was um, the thing that everybody talked about the next day was how it was the first time a lot of those undergraduates had enjoyed each other's company in spite of uh, political differences. We had a, a familiar term. Uh, we had jocks, and the other familiar term was we had pukes on the, <laughs> on the undergraduate uh, uh, student body. That was kind of the term to characterize those who were sort of anti-war hippies versus traditional-minded uh, Maybe right wingers. Not all jocks were right wingers, and not all right wingers were jocks. But you know, for convenience, that was kind of the the stereotype uh, fun words that uh, we we named each other um, at the time. Anyway, the point was the jocks and the pukes <laughs> were were uh, enjoying each other's company, and uh, you could see them uh, literally hugging and dancing in the aisles, that sort of thing. Because we did a, a really, if I may say so, um, dazzling rock and roll show. We got a good drummer, and uh, we imported one more guitar player, not from our ranks, but from um, later on, uh, at a later concert, we imported uh, a guy that uh, a couple of us had worked with elsewhere who was a very talented young guitar player who went to Brooklyn College. The only non-Columbia kid was uh, Henry Gross, who became our lead guitar player and later had his own hit single song called Shannon about 1976. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, Henry, Henry Gross had his own uh, solo career later. But uh, the quality of our uh, rock and roll uh, doo-wop stuff was uh, solid and the, the student body were really um, um, shaken up and uh, it was the big deal on campus that spring um, whereas the previous spring the big deal had been uh, anti-war riots <laughs> now the um, final flourish that spring we did a performance called that we called Greece Under the Stars, the one in the auditorium we had called The Glory That Was Greece. The Glory That Was Greece, kind of a play on words of, uh, you know, Greek uh, civilization. Part of our undergraduate required curriculum was uh, humanities of that sort. So there was a play on The Glory That Was Greece when we spelled it, not, not like the country, but like uh, what you put in your hair. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just like the right. uh, just like the movie Grease, spelled that way. Yeah, but a good many years earlier, I'll um, point out that uh, this was well before the Broadway musical Grease, or <laughs> the uh, movie, of course, yep. or before the TV series Happy Days, uh, before the movie that was a big hit, American Graffiti. Um, 
nobody had ever done anything looking back affectionately at the music of the 1950s. So it was the big deal on campus, uh, Grease Under the Stars later outdoors drew uh, uh, thousands of people from not only the university population, but around the uh, neighborhood where Columbia is located in the Upper West Side of New York City. Um, show business people in New York got wind of it and uh, started uh, reaching out to us um, sick together this summer uh, instead of going home to your, your uh, families and come back next fall. Stick together this summer, we'll make you stars kind of thing. Um, we were uh, interested in that. As I've told you, that was our intention uh, really when we um, took notice of how enthusiastic the audiences were for the 50s doo-wop songs that we were doing. We scrapped our uh, original songs that were, you know, in, in our terms, uh, modern folk songs that were um, of possible interest for recording. We uh, became a total devotion to uh, rock and roll revival mentality. As I said, the rock at the time was not even called rock and roll. It seemed like it was uh, all about the the uh, acid light show on the back wall and maybe the extended uh, guitar solo, and it wasn't much about uh, really putting on a show. Our uh, intention was putting on a show, doing uh, physical choreography with all of our songs, putting guys uh, on the front line doing uh, dance moves in gold lame rock and roll suits that we got from the leftover costume department of uh, the Broadway musical Bye Bye Birdie, which, uh, if people don't know, was a musical that sort of um, celebrated the rock star, the Elvis Presley kind of uh, phenomenon, and um, had a guy with a gold lame suit the uh, principal rock star, Conrad Birdie. Anyway, leftover Conrad Birdie gold AMA suits were uh, what we put on uh, three of us doing uh, choreographed dance routines out front and trading off lead vocals. And uh, it was a 12-man act. We had lead vocals for all of us, um, guitar and uh, bass and keyboard for some of us, and background singing uh, all the time for all of us, very much a doo-wop rock and roll show. The uh, uh, summer came and we did uh, try to take seriously the idea of making the big time, and uh, we burned through a few managers and ended up uh, staying with a manager who was uh, an old friend of a few of us, a uh, uh, grad student, uh, really an adult, a guy who was uh, 20-something but was already bald-headed and looked 40-something and was very uh, gung-ho show business and very um, self-confident and uh, good at making phone calls and connections. Um, one of our efforts was uh, taking... Uh, student newspaper clippings from um, all the success that we had had on campus to anybody who might uh, book us into a New York City venue. We got um, yes from the uh, um, guy who had the power to say yes, at, um, at least for a test run, at a venue called Steve Paul's that's Possessive S. The guy, the owner's name was Steve Paul. Steve Paul's scene, S C E N E scene, was a uh, club on West 46th Street, just a uh, block or two away from the Broadway Theater District. And we took a two week run in there. I think the tentative uh, decision from the management was, well, put you in there for a week at night, uh, see how it goes. You're going to be opening to some other acts that we've already booked, but uh, 
maybe we'll have you in for an extended run. And uh, I'm not even sure I'm accurate on that. The point is we ended up uh, in there for a two-week solid run. And that two-week solid run was uh, really important because we became lines around the block, sort of word of mouth sensation. Um, a lot of showbiz heavies were in there specifically to check us out. That included, you know, members of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, um, you know, people that we wanted to get autographs from when we learned they were in the audience. But we tried to stay cool and yeah, yeah, nice to see you. And it was uh, there that we first uh, learned of a few um, show business agencies like William Morris and uh, ICM and whatnot, um, having their scouts interested in maybe signing to become our agent. It was from there that we um, ended up uh, taking... Um, the interest of uh, the guys promoting Woodstock. And uh, is it, as it happens, we were the last act that ever played at Steve Paul's scene because um, organized crime in New York City had been insisting that uh, to run that club, Steve Paul pay protection. If he didn't, uh, we wouldn't want anything to happen to this place. Well, one night we were... Um, getting ready to go on, and word came that we were to stay in the dressing room. We weren't going to go on. The club was uh, closing for the night. Um, some of the organized crime thugs had been in there um, making um, uh, brawls happen. The, the brawls that closed the club that night resulted in the club never opening again. I guess Steve Paul refused to pay protection to anybody, and uh, he'd had his fun. The club had been very prosperous for a few years. It had been a celebrated hangout for some of the glitterati in New York City at that time. I know that Jackie O. Onassis uh, was known to go there, and, you know, Andy Warhol and all these very uh, glitterati sort of people of that day and age, and it had become a um, hyper-hipster um, place to go if you were uh, uh, showbiz hippie and uh, the hippie thing at the time was, you know, it was the spillover, the cast of Hair, for example, were known to frequent that place. Hair was a thriving musical at the time and it was um, uh, end of the run for Steve Paul's scene and we were the last act ever to play there. So we had our interest from um, some agents, and we had our um, hopeful interest from a record company or two, and um, we did have the uh, uh, booking to uh, play to um, be one of the acts at uh, Woodstock, which at the time was, what's that? Oh, it's a, it's going to be a um, music and art fair um, up the New York Turnpike. It's an easy um, couple hours drive from New York City. You can get there, can't you? Uh, one or two of us had heard ads on the uh, rock radio stations already at that point in time. We were quick to say yes to uh, Woodstock, although we weren't quite sure what that was. Um, we played later that summer at the Electric Circus, and also at uh, Fillmore East, they were uh, willing to take a chance on us. And uh, we did very well indeed with both of those audiences. And it made a lot of uh, newspaper reviews and uh, seemed really uh, important to us. At the time, doing that well at Fillmore East, and as I remember, well, I do remember, it's not a... It's not something I'm scratching my head about. What I was bragging about was that we blew we blew Three Dog Night off the stage at Fillmore East <laughs> when I was uh, back to back to my uh, dorm buddies in September. That was the uh, one thing that uh, impressed everybody the most. Three Dog Night at the time had hit singles on the radio and uh, was thought to be the uh, act that would get all the attention wherever they went. Um, we did a three-night weekend run at Fillmore East, uh, co-billed with 
night, and uh, our name was not known to anybody. They didn't even know how to. A lot of people were saying Shanana, Santana. But anyway, Shanana was um, so successful with the audience at Fillmore East that uh, after the first night, Three Dog Night, um, we known that uh, they would not uh, follow us. We were going to be the uh, final act on the bill because they didn't want to follow us. So um, that's how we came to have bragging rights that we blew the Three Dog Night off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's uh, Three Dog Night. You know, they're just uh, they're they're well known for just being you know a big a great rock band, and, and just like you were saying, you know, they have uh, so many hits on the radio, and, and then all of a sudden you guys blow them away. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was definitely uh, what we talked about back in the uh, beginning of the new school year. What did happen was we signed with William Morris Agency. Um, we signed a record deal with. Buddha Kama Sutra spent part of late August and a good part of September going right up into the first days of uh, the for an hour the last 50 years and we uh, had an album ready to release in fall later that, that uh, school year so it was a spectacular quick rise to success and um uh, Big men on campus or big investment on campus, to whose point of view, and whether it was your buddies in the dormitory or the fraternity or the professors or whoever it was, it was a big deal that uh, Columbia's um, Kingsmen had uh, changed their name to Shanana from the 50s uh, background syllables of get a job, Shanana, Shanana, okay? Yeah. We didn't want to continue to call ourselves the King's Men because that was Columbia's traditional name. And Columbia, before Columbia University, was King's College. So the King's possessive ass men, second word men, was the traditional name, was uh, Columbiana to use. Uh, and the world seemed ridiculous because also in you know, the Seattle band called Louie Louie. You do remember Louie Louie by oh, the yes. Kingsmen. Oh, of course I do. <laughs> All right. So we uh, took the name Shonana when it was first, um, I think it was suggested one day, and we didn't take it seriously, but we ended up having to take it Thought maybe a lapel button, you know, the smiley face lapel button. That era was when lapel buttons were first getting to be big and widespread, and everybody had lapel buttons of some description. Oh, sure. For ours to get interested in this revive rock and roll thing, uh, one conversation led to another, and we decided eventually that that would become our name. And at that uh, Reese Under the Stars performance that I told you about late spring at the Columbia campus. The student body were of mixed emotions when we said we were changing our name, but we did announce then that we were not going to call ourselves the Kingsmen anymore. And people got used to the name Shanana. So um, when Woodstock came and went, and it was a fun um story to talk about how we'd uh, braved the mud and the potential disaster there and all the people in the clogged New York State throughway and all that. But um, in a way, we were disappointed because we didn't go on at night under the lights as we had hoped to do with the uh, gold MA suits looking so sharp with the uh, spotlights on us. Um We'd been promised we'd be on about 9 p.m. on Sunday night. And the festival went from Friday through Sunday, but guess what? Delays, delays, delays. <laughs> Our actual time on stage turned out to be about 9.30 a.m. Monday. Jeez. And 
we had uh, toughed it out uh, in the shelter of a U-Haul van back in the backstage uh, vicinity, and uh, we were, most of us, uh, on maybe our 24th, 25th hour without sleep by the time we went on stage Monday morning at 9.30 a.m. We uh, had the kindness of Jimi Hendrix to thank for our going on instead of not even going on because uh, it came that uh, he was uh, going to be honored as the individual to close the festival and he said he could wait he let he let all the people that were booked to be on there uh, make to make the stage and uh, be part of this uh, great festival so Shanana was the last act on the Woodstock roster that performed before Jimi Hendrix. And his performance was about 11 o'clock uh, as uh, we were making our way away from backstage in our U-Haul van, hearing him uh, do uh, what was recognizably the Star Spangled Banner. That was my memory of uh, leaving Woodstock to the sound of Jimi Hendrix doing the Star Spangled Banner. Wow. That's pretty, anyway, cool. That's pretty cool. All that at the time just seemed like, okay, survive. Um, how are we going to get out of here? Uh, there was no sense that we were doing something historic or that it would matter all that much to our career. We were disappointed that... Uh, by the time we went on, the 400,000 people had dwindled down to maybe 40,000 people. When we went on, a lot of people were um, waking up in their sleeping bags on that hill slow, that hillside that was the natural amphitheater for Woodstock. Uh, there was plenty of uh, vacant ground to be seen, but uh, during our performance, people uh, walked down to the stage and the crowd became a, a tight crowd crowd. Um, nearer to the stage and the uh, empty hillside behind them. It was almost uh, like we were the morning wake-up music. And the atmosphere was less that of a big deal rock and roll festival or rock festival as it had been uh, the nights before when we were waiting to go on. The atmosphere was more like, uh, I don't know, it, it made me think of when I was a kid, uh, Kiwanis Club Pancake Feed or something. It was the sun rising and people uh, wiping their sleepy eyes and uh, smiling as they, uh, I mean, I, I remember one guy telling me later that he uh, was uh, finished with his uh, hallucinogenics for the weekend and his recreational drugs, he'd survived all right, and he wondered if he was, like, hallucinating us. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were such a um, unexpected uh, feature in a uh, roster like that of Woodstock here are guys doing uh, uh, really primal moldy oldie rock and roll doo-wop songs with dance routines and our dance routines were kind of organized to look uh, symmetrical from the front you could almost uh, I mean people told us we looked uh, if they squint their eyes like a we looked like a kaleidoscope sort of thing. I said, okay. Alrighty. <laughs> well, what did matter was that uh, the uh, film crew for the uh, event still had um, canisters of unused film, and uh, they had uh, caught in their they had caught their stride and uh, knew what they were doing by then with lights, and they. Uh, took uh, good footage of our performance. They um, ended up using one of our songs in the Woodstock movie. Word came back to us later that that was uh, put in there uh, tentatively and they weren't sure they are going to keep it in the movie um, until they showed the movie to the first test audiences in Los Angeles. And in the showing of the movie, the uh, audiences were uh, totally uh, enthusiastic um, with our performance as it appeared in the movie. Oh. So they kept it, 
They kept it in the movie, even though we were, for the most part, unknown. We were well-known around a few um, New York City venues, but um, we were still wobbly. They made that decision before our uh, first album had uh, really been marketed. We ended up uh, in the Woodstock movie, and that became the first way that most people uh, around the USA uh, learned of what we did. They might have heard our name, but here was a, a way that they actually saw what we do. Woodstock uh, booking, of course, uh, propelled us uh, during that time frame, made us uh, all uh, um, entertainment committee that might be debating whether to uh, book us um, on a college weekend for uh, their entertainment. It was uh, sublimely cool that we had uh, been at Woodstock because Woodstock became the signature uh, um, cultural event that uh, a lot of college kids uh, were willing to identify with. So the fact that we had been Columbia University students come out of a, a campus where there had been war riots were um, New York City um, convenient uh, and were with easy reach of. Um, well, The Tonight Show, for example, came from New York City at the time, and so the Dick Cavett Show and the, uh, the CBS equivalent was, I guess, the Griffin Show. Th those things, City being a media center, was part of what made us, I suppose, in the first place, that we could uh, try to um, make it big, even starting off as uh, nobodies from... Uh, a college vocal group. We had confidence in our personal talents because the uh, college vocal group was very competitive to uh, get accepted into in the first place. It was a small group, and the year I started, I think there were uh, freshman auditions. Um, joined this esteemed uh, historic group. Uh, it's going to be uh, more competitive than, say, the Glee Club, but... Uh, if you want to do something that lets you stretch out more and uh, those kind of hijinks and maybe you'll have to tell a joke or be uh, more flexible, you're not going to wear a tuxedo and just stand there. The uh, Kingsman was uh, attractive to me for that reason. There were 36 freshmen auditioned and four chosen for probationary membership. And I'd just become a full member um, no longer probationary when we first doing 1950s so we were confident in our um, talent or uh, ability to uh, do good shows but we wouldn't have dreamed we could break into the big time without the fact that we uh, get on the subway and um, get backstage to the night show with Johnny Carson, Dick Cabot, Merv Griffin, whatever it was, and that there were major showbiz interests um, there in town, and uh, New York City was uh, part of the reason we could even dream those dreams. If I stop talking, does it go silent? And I wonder if we still have a connection. Oh, uh, we still have a connection. I just, <laughs> I just let you talk. You know, I, I feel that's pretty, that's pretty cool. That's kind of, that's kind of the, the history uh, of uh, of Shana La, in your words, I would say. Or, um, I, I wanna. Well, we never got a chance to do an introduction, but I, for people who don't know who I'm talking to, I am talking to uh, Donnie York, one of the co-founders of. Shana La, the well-known, nowadays well-known uh, uh, doo-wop band that uh, did their uh, salute to the 50s and 60s time period, which I think it's still cool that you guys are still doing it to this day. 
Yeah, we, we draw the line at uh, the arrival of the British invasion. We define uh, the uh, primal rock and roll period as uh, that between uh, 1955 when the, the hit uh, Rock Around the Clock sort of kicked off the rock and roll era. And we, we don't do anything chronologically later than Duke of Earl, generally. Duke of Earl is a, a 60s song that sounds like a 50s song. Um, it really does sound like a 50s song, but it was released in 1963. <laughs> but uh, let's see, 1963 was the year the Beatles first became known to America. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, generally, Sean and I does nothing later in time than uh, that period right there. Well, that's, um, all, that's okay though. I mean, you guys, you guys have your set playlists, uh, and it seems like you, you, it still made you a successful band anyway. Our our uh, doo-wop consciousness is um, because of our being a vocal group to begin with. We were together because of our vocal chops, not because of um, our uh, guitar wizardry and our um, interest in uh, performing with choreography was for the sake of the audience, not the uh, um, recording studio. In the recording studio, we did originals later on. Uh, Some of us uh, did write songs and... uh, to this day, I think the, the most successful instance of uh, songwriting success would be uh, Screamin' Scott Simon co-wrote Sandy, which John Travolta sang in the movie Grease. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the uh, fact that we represented uh, rock and roll revival of doo-wop uh, primal 50s songs went directly against our... Uh, being taken seriously as a purveyor of new songs. And it got to be obvious that uh, we were actually working against ourselves um, when we tried to uh, have success with recording new material. We had uh, an album a year at least uh, going up through uh, 1972 and... I think Buddha Records uh, disbanded or, or had a corporate breakup in 73, and uh, the idea of us d- doing uh, continued work with them uh, was uh, abandoned just about the time we were asked to do a disco album. We did a disco album called Shana Now, <laughs> and our television career um, started uh, taking form uh, with a pilot done in 1977. And after the television series uh, gave us uh, a different avenue of show business to conquer, the um, group became um, less of a rock band. And I've always said less less of a rock band and more of a cartoon. <laughs> and... Uh, we became all things to all people, moms and dads and uh, grandparents and grandkids. It was fun to have a no longer um, a hip uh, young adult audience necessarily, but a, sort of a state fair audience that included uh, children and grandparents. And it was more like, uh, this is, yeah, see this stuff. This is how your mom and dad uh, fell in love years ago. <laughs> this, was, this was our music. Yeah. So, you know, rock had been called so often a generation gap, um, the symbolic center of the generation gap that was uh, a big deal in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. And uh, it started uh, dawning on us that, okay, now (laughs) if there's a generation gap, we're the uh, generation bridge. (laughs) So it was, um, along with the the success of our TV series, which... uh, you know, we never tried to be, uh, I mean, if we wanted to be, nobody would hear of it. We were not taken seriously as uh, rock musicians. We were uh, cartoonized, and our uh, 
representing anything that was threatening to state society. You know, rock was uh, for years deemed like juvenile delinquents music or uh, the music of the counterculture and that sort of thing. Yeah. What what was uh, becoming uh, obvious was that it was no longer threatening. By now, it was uh, kind of a unifying uh, force, and uh, our uh, portrayal of rock and roll was very family friendly. We did uh, stop saying we got just one more thing to say to you fucking hippies, uh, and that is that rock and roll is here to stay. Amen. <laughs> Traditionally, that was a, a line thrown out uh, at the uh, end of our live concert. Oh, sure. And uh, we stopped doing that when it was uh, obvious that we were playing to uh, uh, families with children. Yeah. And we uh, we became more family friendly, and uh, some of us uh, started having our own children. And uh, it was never our expectation that uh, we would uh, be doing this all of our lives. But it turned out to be what I'm going to be when I grow up. I used to wonder what I was going to be when I grew up, uh, and the show business seemed like a departure. But uh, if cartoon characters never grow old, then I shouldn't complain that. Our rock band became uh, a cartoon, <laughs> but I've learned. Yeah. You know, people people uh, don't want me to look unlike I looked on the TV show. I've learned to wear the same striped T-shirt and uh, white skinny belt and black shoes with pointy toes and white socks and uh, the uh, greasy hairdo and the sunglasses, and that is my look. If I'm a cartoon character, I. Um, have uh, learned not to complain. <laughs> no, I, I think I think that's great, you know, and that just uh, tells me w one reason why I wanted to interview you in the first place. Because, you know, like I said, Sean and I has been, you know, it, I, I I I grew up listening to you guys. See, I'm only 29 years old, and at the end of the month I'm gonna be 30. And I grew up with rock and roll music. I didn't grow up with right rap music or anything like that. I mean, it was there, but but I grew up loving rock and roll. And I always have. Uh, Buddy Holly and Del Shannon and Richie Valens and all those guys have always been big inspirations to me when it comes to what music really was supposed to be. Thank you. I take the uh, pat on the back. Um, it uh, kind of shaped the world that you grew up in. I believe that uh, our success um, was necessary forerunner to um, anybody taking a chance on a Broadway musical Grease or a movie called Grease or a television show called Happy Days or any of those things that became uh, ways that the general public and people much younger learned of uh, any kind of imagery of uh, that period of time. The 1950s, uh, in terms of social history, really was the first time that young people had enough spending money to uh, buy music without just sharing their parents' music. <laughs> the, the reason rock and roll was possible is because young people, uh, kids, could afford to buy 45 RPM records for uh, 85 cents a pop. The, uh, the fact that that was true and kids were important as an audience in their own right meant uh, kids making music you know, the, the stars, the performers were, were younger, playing for a younger audience, and it was music uh, that their parents didn't have to like. Yeah. And um, that was the first time that it ever happened. Oh, yeah. And it came from the technology that uh, made the photograph record possible and the, the uh, radio and all that, but also from the uh, prosperity that came after uh, World War II. There had never been anything like that, and... Um, that was uh, how it became possible for uh, rock and roll to have an audience that was uh, without regard for um, adults. I if did. adults if adults didn't like it, yeah. there could still there could still be uh, millions of dollars made in that uh, music for kids. Sure. And, and you know one of the one of the uh, band members that uh, really stuck out in your band, uh, even though he didn't stick around that long, but 
uh, Bowser, Mr. John Bowser Bowman. Uh, how how big was his influence uh, when it came to helping the band uh, be a success? That question is uh, one that uh, actually uh, oh makes me um, oh <laughs> un- unhappy that that is um, so widely uh, thought to be true. The fact was that we'd already made the big time when we auditioned and uh, um, brought Bowser in as a replacement. We named him Bowser. His name was John Bauman. We all had greasy doo-wop names. Uh, nobody was allowed to keep their name. I mean, I, I, Donald York, uh, Don York, no, 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 Donnie. From now on, you're Donnie. I pronounced Donny. <laughs> um, and... Uh, it was uh, necessary to come up with a greasy street name, and uh, we started calling him Bowser. And it, it was uh, the television show um, decision to um, portray him as the leader of the group that uh, made it uh, appear that, in fact, he invented Shanana. Shanana invented him, is more the truth. Mm-hmm. Our tradition of never speaking between songs, but just going from one song to the next and leaving the audience breathless was only violated when we had technical breakdowns and there was a need to uh, explain to the audience that we needed to leave the stage while the crew uh, fixed the uh, broken amplifier, that sort of thing. And um, John Bauman's predecessor, Alan Cooper, who sang the lead vocal in the Woodstock movie uh, performance of At the Hop, uh, was always the one who... uh, spoke if anybody had to speak and uh, John Bauman inherited that uh, duty and he was really the the only exception to us not speaking and uh, we always stuck with the choice not to speak but to uh, maintain some mystery about ourselves and these were songs that we didn't need to announce what their name what the name of the song was or where, you know, buy it in, on our next album or any of that kind of thing. We were just song, 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 applause, song, applause. <laughs> so there did come a time when we put a um, make-believe dance contest into our concert, modeled on the uh, Dick Clark American Bandstand uh, occasional dance contest, and we'd pull three girls from the audience to dance on stage with three of us, and we'd have, we would have couple number one, couple number two, and couple number three. And uh, we put John Bauman uh, with microphone in a uh, loud uh, sports jacket and a bow tie and had him portray the uh, obnoxious Dick Clark-style DJ. So that gave him a speaking role, and when the television scouts uh, looked at us and uh, got to thinking about how they would put us on TV, they perceived uh, John Bauman as the one who speaks. And that, um, I'm sure, led to making him, in effect, the leader on the TV show. We were told later on that, uh, because of course we did complain that None of us, how come I don't get more lines? How come I'm not on camera more? How come he's introducing this again? We were told that uh, their formula for successful television was a half an hour show with 10 stars was nothing the public could uh, get its arms around. And we needed some way for the public to sink its teeth in. They had to have one individual talk more than the other individuals and uh, he was the one and he's doing a good job for us and we're uh, we own you you signed a contract with us to do this TV show and give us uh, creative control so we uh, were smiling and nice about that as we uh, went on doing our music and uh, making it a funny enjoyable show in whatever way we could but um we invented Bowser. Bowser didn't invent Sean on Off. So you're asking that question, inevitable as it was. Um, I confess, you know, it made me wince at first. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I just uh, go by what I what I know, I guess. You know, I mean, 
I, I know that he, he didn't uh, invent Shauna because I even looked it up on Wikipedia, you know, just to kind of get a background story before I uh, did the interview with you. But I, I just think it's just kind of nice how you guys just uh, all came together anyway and just worked together regardless of uh, what you, you know, what type of contracts you had or how you thought about each other. Just the fact that you were still able to make Shauna a successful band regardless. That impresses me. Well, thanks. You ought to be impressed because I tell you, we uh, had a lot of uh, uh, contentiousness and uh, always ended up um, shaking hands and uh, going with the majority vote. We were a democracy. We had business meetings. Anybody could say anything. Anybody could object anytime. And uh, keeping the act together was a, a product of that uh, kind of rigorous um, oh, human rights approach to it. Um, you hear of stories where the star of the act was uh, uh, dictating everything and the others had to do as uh, um, told or leave the act. Um, Sean and I never became that way. Um, John Bauman left the act uh, as a result of uh, getting an offer to uh, be a game show host on TV with Gene Rayburn and the Hollywood Squares Match Game Hour. And the money in that was uh, stupendous. It went off the air after one year, but uh, it was his reason for leaving Shanana. Um, he asked us if we might want to take a year off. We said, no way. <laughs> <laughs> so we agreed to uh, amicably uh, replace uh, John Bauman with a new bass singer. And we have uh, been through a couple of bass singers since then. And uh, we're... Uh, very uh, democratic uh, to this day as far as deciding uh, whether we'll take this booking or that booking or uh, um, say yes or no to any kind of an offer. All right. Well, hey. Now, I want to I uh, ask if we can interrupt the interview or sure. or bring it, bring it to an end because of the hour compelling me to yes. uh, <laughs> you know, keep, another, keep another appointment. I've got to uh, get my car keys and... Uh, Get on out of here. Oh yeah, no, th no, that's fine. I didn't know how long we were going to go. You know, I just. Well, <laughs> the truth is, the truth is, you may have other uh, questions, or that this uh, discussion may have prompted you some other questions. And uh, if you have the liberty to edit and uh, leave some of the things on the editing room floor, and just go with some of uh, what you like here, I trust you to uh, make your own choices, and uh, I will. Uh, tell you I haven't said anything I wouldn't uh, say in public, so oh, sure. there's no worries. Well, hey, I, I do appreciate the, the fact of your, that you were nice enough to let me chat with you for this uh, hour anyway. I mean, it, it means a lot, and uh, uh, who knows, if you guys are still touring, you should try to get down to Sturgis, South Dakota, because I live in Rapid City, and I'm only 30 miles from Sturgis, and I know they do, they do type of acts during the rally anyway. Yeah, we played there a couple of years ago, in fact. Oh, so okay. yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, we've got each other's uh, Skype contact and email, so sure. uh, I can be uh, reached, and uh, I will uh, know that you are who you say you are, and I want you to give me the uh, link and uh, let me know when this thing uh, does uh, go on your uh, YouTube channel. Okay, I will let you know, and uh, well, I appreciate uh, the the conversation. All right, thank you. All right, bye bye. Bye. And that was Donnie York, uh, the co-founder of uh, the hit band Shout Na that we're just uh, talking about. And I had no idea that we were going to go into a long, almost hour-long discussion about it. But uh, it's okay, you know. I, sometimes it's nice just to sit back and just uh, hear what uh, the guest has to say, rather than hear what I have to say. Just because I'm the host of the show doesn't mean that everybody, everybody wants to hear what I have to say. <laughs> so. It should be a lot of fun. I think this might have to uh, might have to do a little editing out here, but uh, uh, just because it was uh, the connection was going in and out earlier. But uh, other than that, it, everything seemed pretty good, and uh, uh, we'll see you guys again for another great Frankie Slauson show and uh, some more icons of pop culture right here on season six of the Frankie Slauson show. Bye bye. <laughs>